Hi everyone, thank you for joining me here today. My name is Avishai Shafir. I'm the VP product of a company called Lumigo. Uh, in two words, Lumigo is a platform for serverless visibility monitoring and troubleshooting. We help developers to better understand where they are. Uh, and a bit about my end. Uh, we are developing uh, a pure serverless environment uh, for the last year, so we gained a lot of practices and a lot of experience uh, uh, how it goes and how to scale a team from uh, two people writing code to 15 people writing code uh, and how it goes along. Uh, personally, my background, I'm a developer for over 20-something years. I uh, started developing when I was a kid on a Commodore 64 and since then the computers become more and more sophisticated. Uh, I worked for a company called, uh, called HP Software. I was part of the Mercury division. I was the head architect for the ALM, Application Lifecycle Management Tools, a quality center, performance center. If some of you had the opportunity to use them, they used to be quite popular. Uh, and these tools were about uh, how to do your testing and your life cycle in a better way. So, so I've been around many developers uh, uh, and testers throughout the years uh, dealing with software quality. And in this session today, I'll try to share some of the experience that we gained at Lumigo and some of the personal experience I gained throughout the year, uh, how we can deliver good software fast. This is the the target at the end of the day. We want to increase the velocity of our, of our development team, but we still want to have software that works properly uh, and not uh, failing on us on production. Okay, feel free to stop me with questions. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end, or you can wait till the end and then we'll answer them uh, at that point. So I want to start with something which is very basic when, when we are thinking about testing, and this is the testing pyramid. Okay, it was first uh, introduced by Mark Cohen in his book uh, uh, many years ago, and he said that, okay, when we are developing things then, uh, uh, we have different levels of testing. We have the unit testing uh, uh, that we are doing at, at the, the smallest level, uh, we have the component testing, the oh, sometimes it's integration, sometimes it's API, different kind of things, but at the end of the day, it's how different parts of our uh, application are talking or working with each other. And when we have a UI, we need to make sure that the UI is working properly as well. Now, one of the reasons he selected to use a pyramid for this, for this is that the lower you get, it's much easier and much cheaper to develop tests at the unit level than it is at the component and at the UI, even though today I'm not sure that it's true there are such good tools for the UI, then uh, uh, developing uh, uh, testing for UI is, is much simpler than it used to be when it was uh, initiated. Uh, but for sure, unit tests are much simpler than component or integration tests. Uh, and other than that, it, it brings the responsibility of the developer. I'm as a developer, when I'm writing something, I need to cover it with the right test. Either I'm doing it myself or I have a team that helps me. And nowadays we are moving more and more for the responsibility of the, of the developer. And I need to make sure that they are covered properly. And then I can adopt the more sophisticated uh, uh, patterns of, of, of uh, CICD, of DevOps concept, how I'm releasing good software that I'm responsible. And, and one of the basic things is that I'm wrapping my unit with mocks uh, that emulates the integration to other parts of my application. When we're talking about component, it is more complex, especially if some of the components are not something that were written by my team. Uh, sometimes it's a different team in the organization. Sometimes I'm using uh, something uh, uh, through the web and it's something that I don't have any uh, control over. And then I need to make sure that, that I'm testing things uh, the right way. Now, we had different discussions throughout the day about serverless, and, and this is why I decided not to start with why is, what is serverless and, and the different components. And if there is one thing that is clear uh, uh, just from listening to the sessions today, regardless of your personal experience, is that serverless uh, development is very distributed. We have our own functions. We have the different managed services that we are using. And we are taking the different building blocks and we are joining them together uh, to have a cohesive uh, application. And 
Each unit is doing one thing and one thing good. This is, in a nutshell, you know, the idea behind microservices or, or serverless uh, uh, when we're developing things. That means that the, oops, the other side, sorry. That means that the importance of unit test is still there, but the importance of component uh, test, integration test, is it grows to a different level. Because the fact that a specific unit is working is very far from uh, the meaning that your application is working. So we need to invest more and more into that environment, even though it is a bit more complex. Now, there are things in serverless uh, methodology that helps us make it a bit simpler. The fact that we know that every function or every managed service has a very defined API, and we know how to call it and, and when to call it. Um, the, the fact that, that uh, uh, it is very available uh, and it is very cheap to, to run them and use them, then uh, we are not afraid to run many, many tests because the cost at the end of the day is not that dramatic. But this is something that we need to look into and we need to, to be sure uh, that we are paying more and more attention to, to the level of the, of the component. Um, okay, makes sense? Yeah, so far, no, no, nothing special. Okay, watch the direction. Okay. Okay, so the first question that pops into mind when we are talking about doing more and more testing about integration or even uh, in the unit level uh, is how should I test? Should I test it locally on my machine? It is much easier to debug stuff that is locally on my machine. Or should I put it on the cloud? Because I want to, to see how it works really in production. So, so these are the two challenges uh, that we have. Uh, and of course, we have for, for, for two options, we have three alternatives. The first one, by the end of the position, I'll know which click I need to, to click. The first one is testing it locally. Now, as a developer, the faster way for me to work is to try and run things on my laptop and, and see how they run. And for that, I need some kind of an environment that will help me uh, simulate the serverless environment. So over here, there is, I, I will upload the presentation afterwards to, to speaker's de deck or somewhere like that. You'll be able to, to get uh, all the names. There is a list of uh, tools that helps you do uh, serverless testing locally. Okay? The idea is to wrap it, to give you some kind of an endpoint, to give you the ability to attach a mock, uh, and then you can test your things and in a very simple manner. The two most common from my experience, from what I, I heard from people talking, one of them is the serverless framework, the serverless.com, uh, uh, and the second one is the, the one, if we're, talk, if we're using uh, Amazon, of course, is Sam from uh, Amazon. If we're using Google or, or Microsoft, then we will use the local things over there. Okay, so one thing is that I, can, I have tools that help me do the testing locally. The pro is obvious. It's fast. It's faster than any deployment that you will push uh, onto the cloud regardless of your bandwidth. Uh, uh, and, and, and you can get the, 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 the answers very quickly. It is cheap. You don't pay anyone anything. It's your environment. Okay? And uh, easier to debug. You have a stack trace. You, you can look and see what's going on. Uh, but there are cons. The first one in a very distributed environment is, is that we need to have good practices. It's not a real challenge. It's something that is quite easy to solve, but you need to make sure that you are mocking, that your mocks are mocking the last version of the other functions that you are working, the other things that your team members are doing. Now, when we are talking about a mock, some of the people are doing their, their own mock just uh, around their functions. They are writing it themselves based on what they are familiar that the other functions are doing. In some cases, uh, we have as a team, we have a, a, a mock stack where we are taking uh, the different mocks from, from one central place. And when I'm developing something, I need to make sure that the mock that represent my functions is being updated properly. Otherwise, people are testing the wrong thing. Okay? So, so it's an important thing that we need, we need to remember. Not complex, but need to remember. The second thing that we need to, to make sure that we are doing properly, when we are talking about serverless, we said 
and it was said in previous uh, uh, sessions today as well, that on one hand, we have our code that we are putting. We are just writing our code, our business logic. On the other hand, we have all the configuration for the managed service. When I'm using an API gateway, I need to put the right settings or, or the right configuration. When I'm using DynamoDB, I need to put the right kind of uh, setting. Now, we need to make sure that the, in the environment, in the local environment that we are working with, we are using the right configuration or similar to what we have in production. Otherwise, we might find different behavior than what, between what we are testing and between what we actually see when things are being executed. Okay? And a sad but truth uh, fact is that not everything can be mocked. Okay, so there are mock things for DynamoDB and for uh, SCS and for S3 and for different kind of things, but not all the components that we are using can be mocked. Uh, uh, and if you don't have what you need, then it becomes even more chaotic. You know, if you want to see how your function is working with a queue, then you need to have some kind of a local queue that, that you can test it with it. Otherwise, you are simply not testing the right thing. So there are pros and cons for doing local testing. The second option, if you decided that I'm not sure that 100% that local is, is the right thing for me, is a hybrid approach. Let's put all the managed services, uh, uh, and this is an example for AWS, but it's true the same goes for, for Google or for, for Azure or anything else that you're using. Let's put the managed services on the cloud and use them. All of them, all the team can, can use them. And then we are making sure that we are not uh, falling for the configuration problem. Okay? And on the other level, uh, the, the actual, my code, my functions, I will test locally on my environment. This kind of a scenario can be set up. It's a bit of a bummer because it's, it's quite a, it's a lot of work to, to maintain it and manage it. Uh, uh, but on one hand, you know, uh, still the, the cost here will not be dramatic. It's not such a big uh, thing uh, to, to have the, the managed service up there, even though you will start paying for them immediately. But it's for the entire group. It's not such a big deal. And still, you can easily debug uh, your code. And, and you don't have a barrier of deployment. It doesn't take a lot of time when you're changing your, 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 your functions, your Lambda, and you are deploying it. It doesn't take a lot of time to deploy them. But it takes, okay? So, so in this case, everything is still on your computer, uh, and it's not that complex. The third option is to make, to do testing on the cloud, like, like it's going to be in production. So the first good thing about it, it's production, like this is exactly how it will be there. The second thing is that we need to take into account uh, how, how we are building this kind of, of environment. And now I'm talking from our experience. We try different things. Uh, uh, but in order to do proper testing on the cloud, you must have an, an account for each developer. Yeah, there are ways how to aggregate all of them into one group, and then the payment is going from one invoice, and you don't need a credit card for each one of your developers. Amazon ha Console has the ability to do this kind of, of uh, uh, creating the different uh, uh, accounts. But you do need an account for a developer, and uh, when your team is at a certain size, it looks more reasonable, it makes more sense. And I, I don't know to tell you what, where, where is uh, the line where it makes no sense, because currently we have 15 developers, and I don't know yet what's going on in, in, in a team bigger than that, when I'm talking about serverless. In other companies, I worked in teams much larger. OK? Now. The cost question pops into mind. If I'm creating an account to each developer, isn't it expensive? Uh, do I need to allocate more money in order to do that? And actually, I must tell you from our experience, the cost is neglectable. Again, I'm talking from an experience for up to 15 uh, developers. I don't know, maybe when you'll have uh, 500, uh, it would be a different story. But uh, uh, at, uh, I'm sure that until the 100 mark, if I'm taking the numbers that we, I'm familiar with, uh, the cost is, is neglectable. It's several hundreds. It can get to several hundreds of dollars a, a month. Think about the time that you are saved when you have one cohesive environment and the, the fact that you will not have failure in production just because of configuration issues. It's, it, it makes sense. Okay? Now, the next challenge is 
deploy time. If okay, all, all creating the entire environment into deploying everything every time, uh, taking everything from the, the uh, through the CI/CD tool that we are using uh, and put it up, it takes time. Okay, and. For that, there are some ways that you can uh, do, you know, different tweaks. This is an example of what we are doing. We are using uh, Circle CI as our CI CD environment. Uh, we have, based on the language that you are using, we are developing in Python and in Node.js. Then, uh, based on that, we have different frameworks for, for the unit testing and testing that we are doing. And we just created a very simple uh, uh, script that checks if something uh, uh, was changed since the last time that we did the deployment. If most of the functions were not changed. Only my, my personal function was changed then. We will push only, I will push only my personal function. If uh, other things were changed, then let's start the deployment from scratch and have everything up there on one uh, uh, as, as a holistic environment. Okay? Makes, make, make sense to this point? Questions? Not yet. Brilliant. Either you have no idea what I'm talking about, or it's, you really know it. <laughs> okay, so the next part would be, uh, be careful of the limitation. Uh, in the past, that, that slide was more critical when, when, the, when the time for, a, for an execution was very, very short, the, the function timeout. Today, with 15 minutes, you know, we talked about it uh, the, in, in other sessions. Uh, not every use case is a good use case for serverless. In the use cases that, that fit serverless, your, your, your function shouldn't go above 15 minutes. In Amazon, they will simply be timed out. Uh, but there is a set, this is, a, a, I copied it from the AWS uh, website. It is very clear what are the different kind of uh, limitation uh, that you have. And you need to make sure that what we are building and what we are running is not breaking that, uh, that uh, time frame. Okay? Good. The next slide uh, uh, is talking about check, uh, do test to optimize the way that you are working or the way the cost that uh, it will be charged for you based on if it makes sense. Now, it not always, always it makes sense to do the testing. You know, if you are going to save a dollar a month, then, then don't go in there at all. But there is a paper, a very interesting paper that Jeremy Daly published, and we have the honor to have Jeremy Daly with us today. So if you have a question about that, I'll just ask him to answer. <laughs> and uh, uh, showing that if we are allocating a higher level of memory consumption, and in Amazon at least, when you are taking more memory, then the cores are jumping with it, okay? Uh, at, the, at the low level, then you are getting one core. At, at, uh, I think in uh, 1024, you are getting four cores already. I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, and if the execution time is shorter, then the cost will be shorter as well. So instead of running for 11, almost 12 seconds, and pay a certain amount, you can get almost exactly the same amount, but running for uh, a second and a half. Okay? Now... I'm not saying that every time that you have something, every function that you have, you need to do this kind of calculation. Uh, uh, it might be a bit uh, of a hassle, but uh, take a look at your environment and see what is the duration. And based on that, it is something that we need to consider. Okay, look at it as, as a kind of a checklist, things that I need to consider. Okay, now we did testing. Lovely. Of course, most of our code is written in such a good way that there is no problem whatsoever. Every now and then, I'm developing for over 25 years, there are bugs, not bugs, issues. Something is not working as it should. And then we need to do troubleshooting or debugging. It depends the level. Troubleshooting is for the system and debugging is for the code or something like that. And then we have new kind of challenges when we are talking about serverless environment. Uh, why? Because there is a tracing issue. 
Serverless is very distributed, and there is a lot of asynchronous calls in your system. And of course, if you are going through a Q and SQS, then of course, then, then it's asynchronous. But other than that, because the whole concept, if I have a function and I'm calling something else to be executed, then I don't want to do a sync and wait for, this function will wait for an answer, for a return value. It will probably go down. It depends how you are building and it depends on the use case. But there is a lot of asynchronous call across uh, a serverless environment. And then we need somehow to trace it. In the good old days when, when everything was a monolith and everything was in one uh, memory uh, area, then we had a stack trace. We have the memory stack trace. We could look back and see exactly what's going on. In, a, in serverless, if something st stops working here, I can look back, but there is no nothing there. Okay, it already, already went down. So we need to do the tracing. And there are different kinds of way to do, uh, to do the tracing. There, there is the, the open tracing and, uh, and the juggers of the world. And there are different tools. It's not necessarily tools, a concept, uh, how to do it in an efficient manner. Tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, there is a session on that. And I think this is a very important and interesting topic. I think that you should listen to it. At least I'm going to listen. Uh, uh, and uh, we need to work on that. Now, it's doable, it's not rocket science, it's just a lot of work. And there are tools that can help you do it out of the box. I'm not going to talk about these tools. I'll give you a hint, I'm wearing a shirt with the name of such a tool, but uh, uh, there are tools that will do this out of the box. You need to look and see if you want to do something in a manual way and encode it, or if you want to do something that you just include it and the hell with it and everything's happening. It's exactly the same way as uh, Ori showed us today in the security uh, session. Everything that he, is, that he shared with us all the different tools. You can go and implement each one of them. He wrote a very good paper where you can follow them, or you can implement, or you can include a library from Ori's company, and everything will be done automatically for you. So it's, you know, it's a decision point. Before I'm going to the summary, because I'm almost out of time, questions to this point? OK, well, at the same point. Yes? If you've broken up your, your stack into sort of many, many functions, you've got a lot of things dropping and being delivered at different times. Mm -hmm. and traditionally, it, that integration point where everything's coming in can cause quite a lot of churn because you've lots of unrelated changes coming in. Yep. Is that something that you see becoming increasingly difficult to move to service? Well, not necessarily. It, again, it, it very depends on the use case and the architecture that you have created. The potential is there. Uh, if you're doing uh, uh, different calls and uh, asynchronous calls and, and you're throwing things into queue and you're not monitoring them in a proper, proper way, yes, you will be surprised how many things happen. The same thing, the same challenge ha we had in microservices world and in, in, in all the worlds, but over there, uh, the, the monitoring was so integrated, you know, we, we had the new relic and the, the, the app dynamics of the world watching us, uh, and we saw when these kind of things were dropping. It is much easier now to drop things and not notice. Uh, and this is why we believe that doing a proper monitoring adapted to, to serverless is important. I don't think there should be, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Maximilian, I'm, I'm making you uh, run between the different things. Uh, uh, I don't think that it is more tricky or, or more likely to happen than it used to happen in the past. Okay, it's a, again, good software engineering uh, methodology. I think that, first of all, write good software. This is a, a good notion. Uh, secondly, use the right monitoring tools. Have monitoring on your, in, uh, monitor, today in serverless world, we, we like to call it observability. But uh, <laughs> use monitoring tools, use observability tools, observability tools and, and, and they will help you spot them out. Looking at CloudWatch and trying to look for the things that went, uh, Come on, there are so many invocations. Uh, uh, it is very hard to identify the problems that, that it happens. And by the way, sometimes things that get lost, it's OK. You know, we have the mechanism. We are building the, the, this, the, this mechanism into our application. OK? OK. Anything else? OK, so, so I'll start with the summary, even though I'm a bit cheating here, but there is a new point that I haven't talked about before, so I'm not summarizing it. But uh, uh, 
These are our, this is our experience, this is our recommendation, this is the way that we found at Lumigo that it is best for us as a development team to work. We are not testing locally, we have a dedicated account for each developer and we are doing all the tests on the cloud because we believe it saves us time, it enables us to move faster and to provide and to produce better software uh, because it behaves exactly the same. Okay. Um, when you have, when you are including uh, uh, packages, and when you are including large packages, uh, I don't know why I put it here, it's, it's, it's from a different talk, but uh, consider layers, believe me, oh, we can talk about it offline because it's not related to the testing. Um, low testing. Uh, Sometimes, you know, when we are defining uh, the access to the, uh, to the database uh, for DynamoDB and, and sometimes to the RDS, we are defining how we are configuring uh, what is the read uh, capacity and what is the write capacity. And we are thinking, uh, when we are doing it, on the functions that is going to call the, this time DynamoDB table. Now, if I'm creating, and, by, and with the time I will create additional functions that are, or, or services that are calling the same table, uh, I'm not sure that the capacity that I planned originally is the right one. And without doing a load testing for the entire environment, I will not notice it until it will be too late and I will have uh, uh, timeouts and things will not be updated as I'm thinking about them, as I, as I think that they will happen. Okay? So load testing in general in software, it's a good practice. Uh, in serverless, it is cheaper and very simple because you're just provisioning uh, uh, the scalability issue that the vendors promised us that it's scalable without limits. So you can use it, you can run it, you can see if it works. There is a very interesting serverless artillery. It's an open source created by uh, the guys at Netflix, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, it's really cool. Look it up. Uh, uh, and it can help you in this uh, experiment. Uh, another, this is the point that I referred that I didn't talk about. Cold Warm, it's the hottest the discussion in serverless is the function is cold, is the function is warm, you need to consider, uh, uh, you need to test it and you need to decide what is good for you. If uh, you are running an asynchronous uh, uh, process, that if it starts now or if it starts within four seconds, I'm exaggerating, uh, nothing will happen. I don't care if it's cold or it's warm. If you have more sensitive errors in your application, make sure that uh, uh, you are testing if the functions are cold or warm in a real scenario, in a real use case. Uh, split the environments. Don't do your testing on production. It's tempting. It's saving money. It's bad practice. The reason I'm saying it, because I saw it happen in serious companies. Uh, I was amazed, I thought I was dreaming. When I saw it at the second company, I said, let's put a bullet about it. I don't recommend to work like that. I think this is bad practices. Uh, test function memory allocation, like you saw in the paper from Jeremy. And if you have any questions about this topic or if you want to, to further discuss, I'm here today, I'm here tomorrow. I'll be more than happy to share with you more from our experience. Feel free to talk to us, uh, to monitor us. We are publishing every week a blog uh, in our website about serverless uh, aspects. Uh, we have uh, 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 an unknown writer helping us. I think his name is Jan Troy. Troy. Uh, probably you saw one or two of his blogs. Uh, and uh, I'm welcoming you to have a look. Last question, because I have another 60 seconds before I need to hand it over. Yes. Sorry, how? So, in order to, you need to create an environment uh, to have the CI/CD uh, with all the different tests that you are using. You need to see when you are, how you are provisioning in an efficient manner, and you need to set, like in general CI/CD, what is the criteria when, well, when uh, a check-in or, or a, a PR is something that needs to run the entire pipeline, or when it is something on the side. I believe, in general, that if you want to, to play CI, continuous uh, uh, CI and CD properly, you need to invoke and run it. From our experience, this is what we're doing. We are doing uh, uh, all the running for everything. It didn't increase the costs in, in a way that uh, we are bothered with it. It cannot uh, replace developer uh, environments. Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's a combination, but it's not instead. OK. Yes, but the, the problem is that 
it's an integration. The application is, is a composite application. We are taking functions and, and components from different places. If we will not test the, the, the last version, and it's a real issue, and you need to look into that, then maybe your test, are, you're a good developer, but the application crashed. Okay? Okay, guys, I'm here. I'll be more than happy to continue the discussion. Thanks you for being here today. Have a lovely day.